وحمد لله رب العالمين حمد لله وفي نعمه ويكافي ومزيد والصلاة والسلام على خير النام وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم إننا وإن التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والدعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير والحث والتمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسول الله ابتغاء مرضات الله وكربه وتوابه سبحانه وتعالى praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى the most mighty the glorious the majestic we ask our Lord most high to send copious and eternal blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallam and we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we teach and learn and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. <coughs> so if inshallah as we shall we turn to the beginning of the book we'll all read in Arabic first inshallah. And one of the things that we say when we uh, the adib of Ahl al-Yemen um, ahl the, um, the etiquettes of the people of, of the ulama of Yemen when they read a, the book of, of a particular scholar, they say, قال المؤلف رحمه الله تعالى نفعنا به وبيكم رضي الله عنه 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 وعنكم. They say the, the the author has said, may Allah have mercy on him, especially if they passed away. May Allah have mercy on him. May Allah be pleased with you and pleased with him. May Allah benefit us from him and benefit us from you, because the people who who um, who learn and teach, they're in the old من رياض الجنة. They're in the 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 pasture from the pasture of Jannah. So the pleasure of Allah is with those people. And then nafana bihi wa bikum, may Allah give us benefit from that which has been written. That's all of us to learn. And then may Allah make us benefit from yourselves. Because inshallah, when you practice it in your lives, you'll change, you get closer to Allah. That's beneficial. And then inshallah, when you implement it in your lives, you'll propagate it to other people inshallah azawajal. So that's part of the adib that we'll, we'll keep continuing, inshallah. So we did the muqaddama that first time, so we won't worry about that. He says, Rahimahullah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa dilahu anhu ankum. It's a bit different in the, um, um, in the, the Arabic one. So what we always do as well, we read the Arabic just for the barakah because originally it was in the Arabic language and there's, there's nur in the words there and, and there's you know, benefit, inshallah. Says النيات قال المؤلف رحمه الله رضي الله عنه وعنكم نفعنا به وبكم النيات الصالحة قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى قال عليه الصلاة والسلام إنما بعثت يبعث الناس على نياتهم وعليه وقال أيضا عليه الصلاة والسلام من غزا ولم ينوي إلا عقالا فله ما نوى so I'll make sure that they match up because I know I had a look at it earlier, but I didn't note it. So he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim on page 42, the PDF, I'm not sure what, what 36 for the PDF, Jazakumullah khair. If you guys can keep up, updating us on that as we go. It says, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the compassionate, righteous intentions. The envoy of Allah, sallallahu alayhi he said, said, verily actions are only according to intentions and every man shall have according to what he has intended. Whoever makes hijrah for Allah and his envoy, then his hijrah is to Allah and his envoy. And whoever makes hijrah to achieve some worldly benefit or to take a woman in marriage, then his hijrah is to that for which he made hijrah. This is, this is the hadith, the prophetic tradition in which Imam Bukhari began his sahih, making it the prologue to his book. And then, then I'll read the other one. So we've already done that hadith. We've gone through it and we've explained it. And I'm sure, bi'idhna Allah you all understand it, inshallah ta'ala. So... Um, I'm not, not going to go through it again because that we spent almost basically the whole class the very first time on it. And then he says, so Imam Bukhari started sahih, his sahih, sahih Imam al-Bukhari, um, with, with, with the hadith as the first hadith. And a, a lot of the books of hadith, they start off, the books of the prophetic tradition, they start off with that hadith because it's imperative. If one's intention isn't correct, What's the point of writing the book? And even the, the, the ulama of al raqaiq the ulama of the spiritual states, al tasawwuf sometimes they're called as well, they say if a person writes a book about uh, ascetism or zuhud or renunciation of the dunya and their intention is to make money out of it, even a person is reading that book and they're reading the verse of the Qur'an, they're reading the hadith about renunciation of the dunya, but their love for dunya will increase because the author's intention was to earn money, not to benefit people with knowledge. So that, that's the level it goes to in accordance with what the, the scholar ulama al rabbaniyun as they're called the, 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 um, the divine scholars, if you want to call them that. So then he says, 
وبه صدر البخاري كتابه الصحيح فأقامه مقام الخطبة ويقول الشيخ عبد الرحمن بن مهدي لو صنعت كتابا في أبواب في, في الأبواب لجعلت حديث عمر بن الخطاب في الأعمال بالنيات في كل باب. So this this sheikh his name is Sheikh Abdul Rahman. He says I'm sorry, Sheikh Abdul Rahman bin Mahdi, and there's a, you can have a read of who he is um, there. He, in footnote four, he said, "Had I composed a book in the form of chapters, because previously books weren't in chapters, they just used to write. Because it's not like today. If we think that you know we've got reference books and we've got computers, these people because they were people of Allah, that's why their books have lasted." Yeah, who can remember the, the, the New York bestseller from April 2014? Uh, it's gone, that book. It's dead and its author's gone too. No one remembers those books. They're hacked, come and go, right? But they we're reading a book that was written how long ago? And the other books of Imam al-Haddad, Imam Ghazali, Bukhar. They're hundreds of years old, these books. The reason why these books have lasted is not because of the words or the intelligence or the, it's because of the, uh, as a gift that we, uh, from Allah, a thought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these people, these men, these ulama and women, these scholars, they took at that time. And they had reached the stage where they were ready to take from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they would sit down and write these books like this book, written in one night. They're not like us, you know, it takes us our PhDs. How long do you have? Three years to work on the PhD, four years. I've been a six years, I haven't even started yet. This is haki khaldi when I was a bit so it's, it's not like that these people have a state with Allah and they write in their state that's why there's always mistakes in the books because they're writing in this in their, as they're recalling it they're not like getting 10 research books and, and reading it and looking at it and there was a, there's, there's a book by a scholar who passed away not long ago um, it's a very very good book it's mashallah 12 volume he took 3 years off life and he did all this and there's just people hammering it it's only, the book's only 20 years old they're hammering it because it's not written in that same state, but the books that are written in that same state, even though there's errors in them, even though there's errors, it's, it's divine. It's, they're writing in, in, you know, with divine, so to speak, intervention. So that's how these books come. And that's what the Sheikh, that's what the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman bin Mahdi, he's saying that if I, if I composed the book and it had chapters, I never used to use chapters, it's right, right, right. Right, and later on someone came and put the books into chapters. Bukhari is the same Muslim, all of them. Most of the books, they didn't have chapters. So, and he said, how do I compose the book in the form of chapters? Is that what the footnote says? I didn't even read it. No. He says, I would have placed the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, which is that hadith we just read, that verily intentions are by their actions. Actions are by their intentions. He said, I would have put it in every chapter. Why? To remind us, where are you going? Where are you going? Why are you reading? Is it so you can say, brother, that hadith is da'if? Is that why we're reading? Is that a da'if hadith, bro? I hate when that happens. What are you talking about? Like we live in a time where those hadith are, are, are known. It's not like, you know, we live in a time, you know, if the scholars of these scholars, if they lived in our times and they had the resources we had, Allah alam what they would have produced. They didn't have access to what we have access to. I have a little app here. It's got all the, most of the books of tafsir, most of the books of, it's just, this type, type of, you don't even have to, if you're looking for a hadith, you can't remember, you just remember one word of it, and it brings up all the hadith that have that word in it. They didn't have that. To find that hadith might take them a month, or as Imam Shafi'i, or Imam Bukhari, they travel one year to get one hadith. They travel one year to get, and they would get there, and I look at the guy, like, what happened with Imam Bukhari, he went to the guy who's going to narrate the hadith and he had nothing in his hand and he called the, sh the animal, the beast, the burden, I think it was the horse. He's going, come, come, come. But he's got nothing in his hand. And Imam Bukhari goes, if he lies to the animals, maybe he's lying about Rasul. I said, no, I'm not going to. After how long traveling? Or the other, the other sheikh that came from Andalus, he came from Spain to learn from Imam Ahmed bin Hanbil. When he got there, Imam Ahmed, he was under house arrest. He was not allowed to teach people. He came as a beggar. He went and got himself all dirty. He came and he's big at the door. Because beggars, in the, in the days, they sit on the door until they get what they want. They never used to, they got nothing else to do. Right? And then he came as a beggar. Then Imam Ahmed taught him that way. Because the Khalifa didn't let him, you know, teach. That's how, and we got all this access to all these things. How you, even if it's daif, you say what, bro? I'm not making a fatwa on it that, because of this hadith, do whatever. Just take it easy. And it's all right. 
Then we said, Cape Calm, we need one of those shirts. Cape Calm, Cape Calm, it's a hadith, it's all right. That's not Moldu, you know. If everyone, if everyone ever makes it, I'll buy one. No worries. I'll be first to buy it. All right. And then he says, وهذا, and this talks about, وهذا, وهذا الحديث أحد الأحاديث التي يدور يدور الدين عليه وروى عن الشافعي أنه قال أنه قال هذا الحديث ثلث العلم ويدخل في سبعين باب من الفقه. With related to so that part was missing. He says this, this hadith is one of the hadith. Um, it might be missing here because this is an, an, an amended version that um, Habib Saad Lai he did in 2011. So this is a, an, like a because he did it at that state. And then it was translated into five languages and it became popular. There's mistakes in it. So he did a second edition to fix it. Um, and then he says that Imam Shafi'i, it was related that Imam Shafi'i said this hadith is one third of knowledge and it enters into 70 chapters of fiqh, which is jurisprudence. Fiqh, jurisprudence, it means understanding. The capacity to draw a ruling from primary sources means a person has to understand those primary sources. That's what fiqh is. That's what our law is. Now, the jurisprudence is the way that law is develops or is developed. So and that's what Imam Imam Shafi'i says. He says it's it's a third of all knowledge. Our intention. And it's seventy, it covers seventy doors of fiqh because most of the doors of, of the of the, only, the only thing you don't really need an intention for is zakat in the shafi'iyah anyway. Oh, Ahnef might be different. In the shafi'iyah, if the person respond al amilina alayha, the people responsible for collecting zakat come to your house, and you're not, we don't want to give zakat, and you, they you, they count forty sheep because every forty sheep, for example, has one sheep. They take the sheep, and they give it to the whatever they do with it because there's different things depending on the circumstances. That's it. Zakat's taken care of. That's why in the Shafi'iyah, you don't have to be a certain age to pay zakat. So if a child has got an endowment or a trust fund or whatever it is, the person responsible, the executor or the trustee of that trust fund, has to get the money and give it for the zakat. But everything else basically needs an intention. That's what Imam Shafi'i is saying. You, you can't pray without an intention. You can't make wudu without an intention. You can't fast without an intention, particularly Ramadan, which is coming up in about six weeks. It doesn't work that way. A person's got to... Got to be ready for it. Got to have the intention because Allah, that's what Allah wants to see. Allah wants to say, what are you doing? Do whatever you want. But if it's not for me, I don't want it. That's what Allah says to us. Allah says that to us. If it's not for me, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll talk about it in the future as well. And goes on to say, I don't think it's mentioned here. Oh yeah, it is. And Yahya ibn Kathir, قال تعلم النية فإنها أبلغ من العلم. says يهدي ابن كثير said the sayings of the of the ulama or the scholars concerning the intention on forty three. can everyone see a copy of the text? you guys see a copy? Can someone you guys got extra one in the middle or something? try and sit next to one of these guys up here so they can see can see sisters as well. try and mix up there. or if there's, a, if there's two copies next with two ladies, pass them back. 43? 37 on the PDF. Yeah. Alright. So it's on the website. Where is it? Where is the thing you can get it? It's on the website. It's on the, page. It's on the web PDF. website. It's, it's on the Facebook page. If you want to get the PDF happening. It's on the WhatsApp. All right. okay, it's on WhatsApp too. So it's everywhere. Don't, don't come next week please without having it. Because... This, what's the point? We're reading from the book. If you read from it, you'll see it, you'll hear it. Inshallah, you'll be able to implement it. He said, Yahya ibn, ibn Kathir, or here it's got Ibn Al-Kathir. No. Not in, 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 not in the Arabic. It says, An Yahya ibn Kathir. Here it is, Yahya ibn Abi Kathir. It's probably, it's probably missing it in the Arabic. Anyway, he says, learn about the intention, for verily it is of greater import than the action. Why do you think it's of greater import than the action? It's where you have a higher chance of getting your intention accepted than your actual action. So. Well, it's even further than that. That's true. It's even further. Why does it have to one, one worry about their intention so much? Yeah. Yeah. Without the intention, the right, the there's no point. 
Exactly. Without, without a bit of shriek, if there's out, no intention is not right, don't worry how right the action is. Pointless. And then he says, وَعَنْ زَيْدْ أَشَّامِ قَالَ إِنِّي لَأَحُبُّ أَنْ أَكُونَ لِينِيَةٌ فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الطُّعَامُ وَالشَّرَابُ Says Yahya Ashami, uh, sorry, An Zayd Ashami. He says, I like to have an intention for everything, even my eating and drinking. And that's what we want to get to, inshallah. Right? That's what we want to get to. We want to get to that we're constantly conscious of our own hearts. Constantly conscious of our own hearts. I mean, doesn't it sound like, sorry, I don't want to insult anyone, not even myself, but like, like isn't that what we should be conscious of more than anything? Yeah? Like, shouldn't I be the most thing that is the closest to me, my own heart? Without it, I can't live. The brain can be dead for a long time, but once the heart goes, and yet, it's probably the least thing that I'm conscious of. I'm talking about myself. Back in the day, the pioneers and the, the tribal people, of course they were conscious of their hearts. Distractions were limited. There were distractions, of course, but they were limited. Unless they lived under an oppressive regime like Bani Israel in, in Misr or the other kings and stuff that ruled. That's a different story. Yeah, but even, even hunting their food or gathering their food, they knew it was coming from a higher power. They knew. From my reading, there's never been a tribe or never been a people that didn't have a religion, that didn't believe in a god or gods because of the way their life was. Now we're atheists because we've got everything. We don't need God anymore. Don't worry, I've got everything. Just flick the switch and the light will come on and whatever. But previous peoples, they didn't have that. They knew that God existed because they were conscious of their hearts. They could you know, hear the beating, so to speak. And I, and I mean it metaphorically. I don't mean it literally. They knew how their hearts, what they were flip-flopping over. So that should be something that's so basic to the human being. It should be something that's so basic to the human being that no other noise can drown out the noise of, of the sound of one's own heart. And like I said, I mean it metaphorically. But today, it's the opposite. Everything is buzzing and, you know, it's, oh, well, nothing buzzes anymore. It's, it's... Right? Everything's so much more that we don't, we, we're, not, we, we're not used to it. Plus, probably boring compared to the... Things that are on there like people tripping over and, you know, cats making cute things. Like, this stuff's like super exciting, right? Compared to my own heart, isn't it? So it's, it's boring listening to my own heart. It's boring. There's more things going on there. When I was a bit subhanahu wa ta'ala. I saw a statistic the other day. I have to tell you. I've got to tell you. I have to tell you this statistic. Seriously, it's scary is not the word. Scary is not the word. It's a bit, you know, like vulgar, but it needs to be said. Pornhub is the world's largest porn website. It reports in 2016, every single day, every single day, 64 million visitors visited. 26% of them were female. Sorry, I missed a part. 92 billion videos were viewed by 64 million visitors daily. That's 2016. That's a long time ago for internet stuff. 26 of them were female, each spending nearly 10 minutes on the site. So the average amount of time is not quite 10 minutes. From 64 million people every single day, 92 billion pornographic videos were viewed on one site alone every day. So it's exciting. Like I said, here, what about your heart for? That's something else. Do something else. Get, let your heart pump about something else, not what, what one's own state is. I, I got flabbergasted by that and sickened at the same. I don't think it was that bad. That's pretty bad. That's one site. And look, that's one site. How, much, how many sites on the internet are porn? 70%. 70% of the internet is based on porn from the statistics that I've seen. So imagine that. If that's not even 1%, that's like one site, but it is the most popular, so I, I don't know how that works, but whatever. And then there's 70%, 70% of the internet is on, and there must be like 
tens of millions, hundreds, it's already tens, it must be hundreds and hundreds of millions of people looking at that stuff every single day. 26% of whom, which I was just blown away by, were female. So of course, our own hearts, ah, don't worry about it. There's a million things to distract us. We want to get away from those distractions, inshallah. And if we need, sometimes we need to be distracted. Yeah? Our distractions should be planned as much as possible. Or, if I just need that distraction, then I have to put a time limit on it. I say, this many minutes, you know, half an hour, <coughs> an hour, whatever it is. But I know what I'm, and I'm conscious of my own heart, even when I'm in my distraction. So, think of it on a greater scale. If we as human beings, right, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Ameen, that firstly, have certitude in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Risala of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam. Five times a day we make wudu and we turn our faces to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We try and read Quran every day. We fast Ramadan, alhamdulillah. And we're in that state. Imagine those that don't believe or reject Allah when a'udhu billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or have a less rigorous form of whatever worship they do. Imagine the state that they're in. And then when we even push that out further... How are we even surprised that people are doing what they're doing like what happened in Christchurch? Like the destruction of ecosystems, like the oppression of native peoples, like, 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 it's not a surprise. If we, if we get the reality of the way we're living and the reality of the states, our state as a human being and the state of our brother on the left and our sister on the right, as it might be, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise how the people on Wall Street can just rip trillions and trillions, and then they go back to do the same thing months later. No one goes to jail, no one cares. Mahakul Allah. Didn't all of us suffer? We paid. Us, to capitalism's dead. It's a socialist society now. Whatever anyone says, when the people have to pay to bail out the big boys, it's socialism. That's what socialism is. So there's no more. Capitalism's dead. Whoever thinks it's alive, got a problem. It's not. 100% dead. 100% it's all over. Yet, we're, that's, the ide, that's the pervasive ideology. Why are we surprised? Why? And then we're looking for systems. Oh, is it democ- Habibi, the individual human being has to be human being first. No matter what system you give the human being, if the human being is, in t- is not in touch with their own humanity, they're going to corrupt that system. Islam is the greatest example of that. What better system is there? It got corrupted how many times? The Abbasiyin, the Safawiyin, the Osmani, all of them. Except for the Khulafa al Rajidin. I think you just press that button behind you, the AC will turn on. So, the thing that we should be most conscious of, we're least conscious of. And who's reminding you? Huh? Who's reminding you? Did you ever see your ad? Think about your heart. Did you ever see an ad? Be conscious of your mind. Have you ever, has ever seen an ad like that? You've seen an ad with naked women or semi-naked women selling toothpaste, selling cars, selling everything. But no one's ever reminded you to say, hey, don't forget yourself. Don't forget your heart. That's how far away we are. And that's how far away we're being taken away from it. When Allah believes subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet we're the people of Islam. So we want to get back to that. Because when you're comfortable with your heart, you don't, don't worry about being lonely. Mm-hmm. Nobody loves me anymore. Don't worry about that. you got Allah, because when you're thinking of, of Allah, He's thinking, He's watching you. He's looking at your heart inside. Pfft. How do you think these salihin and these awliya, there were some anbiya, don't worry about that. There were some anbiya prophets that lived for how many years? Not one person became Muslim, Muslim with them. Not even one person. Did they leave the risala? No, go back to the, they put the sun in my right and the moon in my left. Remember we discussed that last time? We said that that's the kind of conviction that a person has to have if their intention is going to have a change in the world around them. The intention that, I'm going to do this because it pleases Allah no matter what happens. If the end, what was his name? I forget the Sahabi. He went to the end of Maghrib, Morocco, and he put his feet in, in the feet of his horse in the Atlantic Ocean. And he said, look how, 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 for, how much foresight he had. He said, Ya Allah, by Allah, if, he said to the earth, if I knew there was land on the other side of this ocean, I'll ride my horse across the ocean and I'll, and I'll call those people to you, Ya Allah. 
That's the kind of that's the kind of intention that if a Muslim has, Allah changes things just by their intention. That's the kind of intention that's better than a deed. And that's the kind of intention we need to have in the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in all facets of our lives, in all facets of our lives. In other words, I'm going to do it, inshallah, I'm going to die trying. That's the that's the thing. All right. So then he says. وعن داود الطائي قال this is رأيت رأيت الخير كله إنما يجمع حسن حسن النية he says عن داود الطائي he said I have come to realize that all goodness is encapsulated within good intentions and there's no doubt about that whatsoever and he says also وعن بعد الصلاة قالوا من سره أن يَكْمُلَ لَهُ عَمَلَهُ فَيُحْسِنُ نِيَتَهُ He says, Some of the Salaf have said, Whoever so wishes to make his actions complete should perfect his intentions. And Ibn, Ibn al-Mubarak, he says, yep, Ibn al-Mubarak, قَالَ رُبَّ عَمَلٌ صَغِيرٌ تُعَظِّمُهُ النِّيَّةِ وَرُبَّ عَمَلٌ كَبِيرٌ تُصَغِّرُهُ النِّيَّةِ he says, Abdullah bin Mubarak is one of the, the big scholars of our, of our ummah. He said, it may be that a small deed is magnified by the intention and a great deed is diminished by the intention. There's a nice tafsir, mashallah. And Sayyidina um, Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad, he says, وَلِصَالِحَ النِّيَةُ كُنْ مُتَحَرِّيَا مُسْتَكْثِرًا مِنْهَا وَرَاقِبْ وَأَخْشِعْ وَأَخْشَعْ he says, Imam Haddad reflects in a poem, For good intentions always be searching, make them abundant and be conscious and fearful. Be conscious and fearful. And the khashya is that trepidation. It's not so much just be fearful, but be trepid, in other words, have trepidation, be, be afraid that the intention is not right. And if you're afraid, or even worse, there's no intention at all, just going around on autopilot. That's the worst case scenario. وَقَدْ شَرَحَ الْبَيْتُ شَرْحًا وَافِيًا الْإِمَامْ أَحْمَدْ بِنْ زَيْنِ الْحَبَشِ الْعَيْنِيَّةِ He says, فَمَنْ أَرَادَ ذَلِكَ فَلْيُطَالِعْهَا يَطَالِعْهُ He says, uh, Habib Ahmed bin Zain al-Habashi has written a comprehensive commentary on this poem in his Sharh al-Ainiyah, which if one so desires, it can be studied further. And he gives the... the the citing in the appendix, which is in the back of the book. He says, وَقَدْ كَانَ الصَّرَفُ يُعَلِّمُونَ الْأَوْلَادَهُمْ النِّيَّةِ كَمَا يُعَلِّمُونَهُمْ الْفَاتِحَةِ And this is pretty, this, this part here says, it was the practice of the salaf, which is the, the pious predecessors, to teach their children about the intention in the same manner, i.e. with the same care and attention to detail, as they would teach them al-fatiha. Alright? So, not only would they teach them, like, you know, the children, we teach them the fact how they recite any old how. This the Muslim to get the words right. They, they never used to teach their kids like that. They used to teach them how many, how many uh, shaddat, how many, what do they call shaddat in here? <coughs> it's not here. Stresses. How many shaddat in al-fatiha? Who knows? How many times is there, like, you know, rabbi, uh, that bear, rabb, it's a shaddat. How many is in the fatiha? No one knows. There's four. Tell us, Hajj. Fourteen. We have to know that. And every time we recite the Fatiha, because it's the person who doesn't recite Fatiha, Fala Salatullah. That person's prayer is not accepted. Accepted. Yeah. And the person who who should lead the prayer is Aqra'uhum. The person who reads the best, not the person with the nicest voice, not the person who's me, who's memorized the most Quran, but the person who reads Fatiha correctly. There's no point how many times you go and you see people wala zalin or allazina. There's neither there's no zay in the whole of the Fatiha. The whole Fatiha there's no zay. And there's nice kira'a, mashallah, and they read half the Quran in the next in the after, but they don't read the Fatiha properly. It's batil. There's no way you get I know I like it's heavy and all that, but there's no you can't get around it. You can't get around it. So we've got to know these things. How many shaddat? How m- the mud, how long, how long we have to go? What a ball. It has to be five, six, 
depending. You know, different scholars. You can't what dalin. Doesn't work. No, that's it. Batil. It's over. And the difference between al sad was seen. Hardly you see any of the scholars and the ulama and the imams reading it. Different sirat al mustaqim. You hardly see it. You hardly hear it. Hey, it's always the sad. You end up, you know. It's, sorry, it's, that's it. It's not unless someone's got a lisp and they can't pronounce it properly, or they have got some problem with their pronunci the letter jim, for example. They can never pronounce it. That's fine. But it's awla. It's preferred that someone who can recite the fatiha properly be the imam and recite. So it's serious business. The fact the house our yours are all like. <laughs> what am I going to do now? Go learn it. That's what you're going to do. Yeah, so someone who's like that, it's a different story. But al-awla, that he doesn't pray the imam. If there's someone who, if everyone, like there's some towns, they don't have the letter like jim, they don't say jim. Instead of saying like jafar, they say yafar. That's how they talk. So if the whole town's like that, that's okay. But if there's someone in the town that can pronounce it, pronounce it properly, then that person has to pray the imam. You with me? So Sayyidina Bilal, Allah Mardan, he was there, according to the scholars, and they, they've got a different hukum, those guys. They're sahaba, they're, they're different to us. You know? Like if a sahaba comes and everyone's a tabi'i, no one's going to pray, Sayyidina Bilal's going to pray. You know what I mean? But it's up to him. Anyway, let's not open that door, because it's not a door for us to worry about. Yeah? But how serious is it what I told you about the Fatiha? The knee is just as important. And if you don't know how to read the Fatiha, go and learn. Make sure you go find someone who's qualified, preferably with an, preferably with an ijazah from the Sheikh going back to the Prophet and learn just the Fatiha. Especially if you're not going to be a scholar, you don't want to be. If you can't read the Fatiha properly, there's no Salat. Alright, so we start off inshallah as we as, as we mentioned, today that tragedy occurred that the brothers were in the masjid in, in Christchurch. It's, it's more than a tragedy. It's, an, you know, it, it's political wrangling and it's an old of the, something that us as human beings, we haven't experienced in our time where just because a person's belief, they're getting killed, they're getting shot. And those people, that were, those brothers and sisters were in the masjid. And so depending on what our intentions are we, when we go to the masjid, we'll, we'll get from Allah in accordance with that. So he says, Niyatul ikhtilafi ilal masajid. He says, Wal ikhtilafu ilal masajid huwa min fawadil a'mal al muttaqin, wa bihi adharullahu iman al mu'minin, wa yambagi lil abdi al mu'mini, ida kharaja min manzilihi yuridu an yadkula al masjid an yahsil lahu thamani al niyat mustahabbat. Liyaktub, I'll continue in English. He says, going to the mosque, the intentions for going to the mosque. Going to the mosque is from among the virtuous actions of the muttaqun. Because Allah subhanahu mentions him in, in the Quran as muttaqun. The people who build the masajid in the, in the masajid. He says, by it Allah Azza wa has manifest the faith of believers. It is incumbent upon a believing servant who desires to enter the masjid or the mosque to have eight mustahab intentions when leaving his home. لِيَكْتُبَ لَهُ بِذَلِكَ الْفَضْلُ الْعَظِيمُ وَيُنَالُ بِهِ غَدًا مِنَ الثَّوَابِ الْجَسِيمِ فَإِنَّ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَلِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى وَيُؤْتَ كُلِّ ذِي فَضْلٍ فَضْلَهِ This is very... Sorry, I missed that part. So that immense grace, this is on page 44. So if you're not with me, just yell out what page you're on, what paragraph it is, so that we can... Read it, inshallah. Um, so that immense grace is accorded to him on account of this and by which he will be entitled to abundant reward tomorrow. Verily, actions are only according to intentions and every man shall have according to what he has intended and he will bestow his abounding grace upon everyone who is gracious. So uh, when, when he says there, it's from the virtuous actions of the muttaqun. We said that's mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa mentions it in the Quran about those people. And then he says, but, and Allah has made manifest the faith of believers. So there's a hadith that says, if you see a person constantly, a man, it says, going constantly to the, the house of Allah, to the masjid, fashhad lahu bil iman. 
You know what I mean? So you can bear witness to that person's iman. Because, and it'll, it'll cut, become clear why when we read the rest of it. And then he goes on, it is incumbent upon a believing servant who desires to enter the mosque to have eight mustahab intentions. So he's got a, a footnote for mustahab. It is what is desirable. It is following the example of the Prophet of Allah in ordinary matters such as when he drank, ate, walked, slept, and dressed, etc. Following him in these matters is considered desirable. One is rewarded for following the example of the Prophet of Allah but not following his example in matters like this is not considered blameworthy because they are not considered part of the sacred law. So they're not, it's not blameworthy if a person just doesn't do it. But if a person doesn't do it and they say, oh, it's just a sunnah, they, they make insignificant the Prophet ﷺ, then it is a sin. It is a sin. Or if a person purposely doesn't do it, say, I'll do my own thing, that's a sin. Yeah, but if a person just, just not, doesn't, doesn't pay any attention to it or is not conscious of it, then it's not sinful. So he's going to go through the eight intentions, inshallah, when one leaving his home. So that, so that immense grace is accorded to him on account of this and by which he will be entitled to abundant reward tomorrow. He talks about ghadan. It's not a really big thing. It's just saying that that's tomorrow. It verily, because ghad and ghadan are two. Ghad means in the future. Ghadan means tomorrow. That's basically what he's talking about in that footnote 10. Verily, actions are only according to their intention. Every man have, shall have according to what he has intended. And he will bestow his abounding grace upon everyone who is gracious. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Surah Al-Hud there. That he, he decides subhanahu wa ta'ala who will give it to. So the first intention, he says, وَأَوَّلُهَا يَنْوِي زِيَارَةُ الْجَلِيلِ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ فِي بَيْتِهِ He says the first intention, intend to visit the majestic one, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may his majesty be exalted in his house. So that's the first intention. We're not going to Friday prayer just to get the, the, the Friday prayer off my back. Look, I, I know it's hard too. Sometimes you go and the khatib is just like, oh my God, what a shocker. And I have to say, it's not sometimes, it's pretty much the majority of the time. It's not that often you go, no matter what kind of whatever measure you go to, and you hear a decent khutbah. But today the khatib, mashallah, it's an encyclopedia of knowledge, but I don't know what he's on about. This is, this is as we said before, the khutbah is a wav. It's a wav. It's not quite an admonition, but it's, hey, wake up! Worshippers, it's Friday. I know you've probably been doing everything since last Friday. What's going on? This is the current issue that's in our lives. This is what the dean says about it. This is how you, get, this is how you work it out. That's what a Friday is. I know it's great to hear about history and it's great to hear about what this person said in history and it's great, that's all, it's not for a khutbah though. It's not a history lesson. It's not a fiqh lesson unless it, the fiqh needs to be discussed to tell people that, wow, watch out, be, be careful, this is what's going on around you. Do this to avoid it. Yeah, so look, I get it. I get it. So that's why, don't go to see the khatib, go to see the Allah. Rabbul Khatib, the, the Lord of the Khatib. And then your state will be different, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way that you, f that you feel. And the sisters, I know the whole world's against the, the Muslims, are like, the mosques, the sisters can't go in. Oh, like, if I could avoid going to the mosque, I'll tell you, I would avoid it. What goes on in the mosque? It's like an old man's club. If you open the window, everyone looks at you like, <laughs> you think you are to open the window. I'm telling you, that's what happens. Nothing goes on. The biggest mosques, they're four or five million dollar mosques. It's like, you know, like the Jimmy Swaggots of the, of the 80s. Alhamdulillah, someone knows Jimmy, huh? It's like the Jimmy Swaggots with the mega churches and they were building like million dollar houses. That's what we got now. What goes on in these places? Not much. I'll tell you now, not much. You know, what, what are we producing from the Masajid? Not much. Really, not much. What are we producing? And even the people that get produced... What are they doing? Not much. So, sisters, you're lucky you don't have to go there most of the time. You're lucky. You're lucky you don't have to go there. And I know that, yeah, but that's not where equality is, I'll tell you. Because there's not much going on there. And there's a sister, she did a, she did a PhD on it. You can go and read the PhD. Yeah, there's no good in it. There's a backwards doors. If you, can, you, don't, you don't need to go there. That's why, it's, that's why you're lucky. But we have to go there like some guys, oh, why we're there, well, I'm saying, the guys like the, 
you know, the, the executive bodies and the executive people, they think it's their house. I'm telling you, they come and they have conversations while we're trying to pray in the masjid. Say, say something to them and it's a fight. This is, I'm not like exaggerating. All the brothers are going, yeah, I've been there, that's happened. The sister's going, nah. For real? <laughs> yeah, for real. For real. Oh, if he gets on the phone, well, Allah, because he's got to let everyone know he's on the phone. <laughs> yeah, this, that. Oh, I'm not, I know, like, it's, but that's what goes on there. What goes on? What, what classes go on? What social services go on? <coughs> you, got, you know? Always people would pray, oh, Sheikh, I ain't going to get a, a thing, a centre. No, I need a centre for. We hold one or two classes a week. I spend $4 million plus the upkeep, plus the rates for two classes a week. The Zamallah Khair, the Isra, the, you know, they, they look after us, they house us. If you're gonna, in my view, if you're going to have a centre, who should, who should it look after? The women. That's who it should look after. Well, we're out doing silly stuff, beating on rocks and bending metal and stuff all day. Uh, useless, really. Right? It needs, to, it needs to look after the sisters. They're the ones who need the social services. If you can't have social services, if you can't have welfare services, if you can't have things to, to you know, like people who are academics and educated people who can elevate the level of consciousness of the ummah, don't worry about four or five. And I'm talking four or five million dollars ten years ago. Now you're looking at seven, ten million dollars. That's because real estate is expensive, not to say that it's not. Raise 15 now, Allahu Akbar, right? For what? For a massive building that no, nothing goes on there. Nothing goes on. No. Can you just ask a question? Uh, why isn't it there after prayers? Any zikr? Because the question is, why isn't there like remembrance of Allah or salawat? Because the people who run the masjid, the executive committees, <coughs> they want to have their own personal ideology happening in the mosque. It's an extension of the... Oh, it's an old man's club. That's what mosques are old man's clubs. And most of them, by the way, is like, I don't want to mention groups because like, it's like the, you know, the Tuscany Muslim Association. It's like the New Hampshire <laughs> Muslim Association. It's all named after a place. They speak in their, in their cultural languages. And, it's, and if you don't speak that language, and, it, and even if you do speak, if you're not from a certain area within that area, and not from a certain family within that area, don't worry about it. So, um, look, I, I, it's a bit off topic in that, in that regard, but it is on topic because don't go to that place. Go to, to the house of Allah to see Allah. If that intention is there, the, the, the effect you get from going, there's nothing better than the house of Allah. Like, there's no peace. Go to the uh, Gallipoli Mosque down the road here. Go there and see if you don't feel at peace. Go there if you don't forget every worry you have. Go there and see if you don't walk out lighter than when you walked in. There's nothing. It's the house of Allah. There's nothing beats the masjid. I'm just letting the sisters know that don't stress about what's going on there because they don't even want to know about it. So um, when we talk about the, the niyat, as he said, the intended visit, the majestic one, he, may his majesty be exalted in his house. And he says, he says, Wa anta Abdullah. لأن المساجد بيت الله وأنت عبد الله وإذا أراد العبد صاحب البيت ليلتقى معه قصده إلى بيته وطلبه هناك He says and this is, this is what I'm getting at that's what we're going to the house of Allah for that's why we're not getting the benefit irrespective of what's going on there irrespective of what's going on there He says because a mosque is the house of Allah and you are a servant of Allah. Thus, when a servant wants to meet the owner of a house, he sets out for his house and seeks him there. And that's one of the reasons we're not getting the proper benefit out of those places. Like I said, I don't want to disparage the message. You don't think I just want to let you know that, yeah, I know it's not good for the sisters. Don't, don't, what I'm saying is, not only do they not think about the sisters, they don't even think about anyone else. They just think about the little the stakeholders there, you know, and those, there's probably 15, 20, 30 people even though the masjid sometimes has thousands and thousands of people, right? But there's 15, 20 people that got their hands in whatever they're doing and they control and they dictate whatever's going on without having any regard to the, to the patrons, the people that come in, in other words, the musalliyin. Uh, that's just the way it is. That's, that's, that's how it is. So that's what I'm saying to you. Don't, 
if this doesn't apply to you, you don't go to the masjid all the time, don't worry. Because for you, the you, it's easier. You get a prayer mat, you make intention that it's a musalla. You can even, and the Shafi'i, they say you can even say it's a masjid, it's a waqaf. Because the difference between a, a waqaf and a, mus uh, a masjid and a musalla in the Shafi'i madhhab is that a, a, a musalla, in other words, a place where people to go pray, it's not a waqaf. It's not a, it's, in other words, it's not a trust given by the people for Allah. Let me explain it. A musalla is owned by someone and it can later on be changed and not be a, a place of worship. But a masjid is a place of worship and the ownership doesn't belong to an individual. Yeah? It doesn't belong to an individual. So no, no, one, person can claim it. no one can claim it. It's a waqaf. In other words, it's a trust for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the difference. So the scholars, the shafis, which is good for the sisters, they say, get a prayer mat, make it waqaf for Allah, and there's your masjid. Ready to go masjid. Just be careful what you do on it. Because it's, it's a masjid now. You can't muck around on it. You can't talk about dunya when you're on it. You can't answer your phone and, oh, whatever. You know, you can't do those things. Because you can't do those things in the masjid. So it becomes like a masjid. It's a waqaf. And you've got to keep it there. And you can't use it for something else. So if one day, whatever, I don't know, you want to put it on your couch to make your couch, you spilt coffee or whatever, you can't put it has to only be used for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the easier, and that you can do atikaf in Ramadan on that, and it's Iraq and you're in the masjid, you can do all those things. So don't tell me you don't have it easier, sisters, because you've got some, a lot of dispensations that make it easier to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That brother, he's got to, if he wants to make atikaf, he's got to go to the masjid. On Jummah, he's got to go to the masjid. And unless he's got a proper reason, he can't not go to congregation, not go to the, one of the five fadl prayers in congregation. Lucky we're not Hanbalis because it's fadl to go to the masjid in, in congregation in, in, in the Hanbali madhab, Imam Ahmed's madhab. So it's, it's, it's not the same, but it's equal. It works out that way. And then he says, وَقَدْ أَخْبَرَ الرَّسُولُ الرَّسُولُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ وَسَعَبُ السَّلَامُ بِفَضْلِ ذَلِكَ فَقَالَ فِي حَدِيثِ سَلْمَانِ وما من مسلم توضا فاحسن وضوءه ثم اتى المسجد من اتى مسجد من مساجد الله الا كان زائرا لله الله وحق على المزوري ان يكرم الزائر he says the envoy of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam sallu ala rasulillah he said in relation to this virtue in a hadith narrated by Sulaiman there is no muslim there is no Muslim who performs his wudu and perfects it, ablution and perfects it, then proceeds to a mosque, save that he is a guest of Allah. And it is obligatory upon the host to honor the guest. So that's how serious it is. That's how serious it is in terms of the reward that a person who seeks out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and of course, that's why when you go to the masjid, you feel relaxed. Doesn't matter if there's no one in there at all. It's not about who's in there, because it's the house of Allah. And Allah has promised you that. You come to me, what does he say? Come hadith, you come to me walking, I'll come to you running. So Allah Subhanahu wa says in the hadith al Qudsi. So you go to the house of Allah, he's welcome. He says welcome. Actually I'll read the, I didn't want to read it, but it's tied to Walaw Anna Abdan Mitluka Aamaltahu Bil Kabihi. من من فعلك ثم قصدته إلى بيته متعذرا إليه لا أكرمك وقربك وعفى عنك ولم يرض ال الجفا عند ذلك فكيف بالله العظيم وهو أكرم الأكرمين. He says if you wronged a servant of Allah, in other words, another person like yourself through your lack of decorum, and then proceeded to that person's house, his house, seeking to apologize, he, the servant of Allah, would welcome you, accept your apology. Draw you close to him and pardon you. He would not be content to shun you on account of this. How could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the glorious do so when he is the most generous of the generous? So he's giving an example of what happens. I wanted to get to the anecdote. We'll read. There's a nice anecdote that ties this whole thing and then we'll, we'll stop inshallah. He says, يَنْبَغِ أَنْ وَتَعَيَّنُوا أن تمديه إلى بيت ربه وهو وهو بتوفيق الله عناية 
ولو ولو لا أن الله يريد بهذا العبد الكرامة والإلفة لما كان يوفقه لزيارته في بيته. says it is necessary to recognize that when one is granted the success to proceed to the house of one's Lord, that this success is from Allah and His providence. If Allah had not wanted to honor and grant intimacy to His servant, He subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have granted him success or the opportunity more specifically to enter and visit his house. So when a person enters the house of Allah, that's Allah granting that, saying, come close to me. Come close to me, intimacy, nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's from the tawfiq of Allah. And this is the story, he says, وَقَدْ جَاءَ عَنِ الْمُوَفِّقِ الزَّاهِدْ حِكَايَةٌ لطيفة في معنى هذا القول لما تم لي ستون حجة أو حجة قعدت بحذاء بحذاء المزراب المزراب في المسجد الحرام وجعلت أتفكر وأقول إلى كم أتردد إلى هذا البيت فغلبتني عناية فإذا قال فإذا قائل يقول ما ما موفق لو كان ذلك عفوا لو كان لك بيت تجمع فيه أضيافك هل كنت تدعو إلى من كنت تحبه ويحبك فصرى عيني عناية ما كنت أجده he says there's an anecdote, an anecdote was related by Muwaffiq al-Zahid, that's one of the, the um, he says, al-Zahid is a person who practices zuhud, which in Arabic means to abstain from, uh, from something or to refrain. So it's the person who renunciates, renunciates the dunya, that was his nickname. Uh, his name was Muwaffaq, pretty nice name, Muwaffaq, and al-Zahid as well, he was both of those. Okay, and he said, in relation, to this point, he said, when I, compl when I completed 60 pilgrimages to the house of Allah, I sat opposite the Mizrab. Oh, Mizrab. No, he says the Mizrab. Even, even, yeah. Well, that's the Mizrab, and he's saying Mizrab as well. But, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's a different thing. Maybe they, they, there's different ways to... Because to, there's Mizrab is the, the gutter, the gold gutter, that comes off the Kaaba. And when it rains, the water comes in. It's a place of Rahmah because the rain is Rahmah, the house of Allah is Rahmah, the Haram is Rahmah, and of course that Mizrab is, is that... that uh, so you say it's the rain spell? Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah, but there's different ways to, to say it. It's called Mizab. It's called Mizab. Yeah, and they call Mizrab both. They call it, there's two, and that's what I'm saying, there's two, two different names for, for, for it. So, okay? So he's saying it's the, it's the rain spout on the Kaaba in the Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque. And he began to reflect. I asked myself, how many times have I visited this house? Then he slept, uh, and then sleep overcame me and I heard someone say, Oh, Muwaffaq, if you owned a house that you could call all of your guests to, wouldn't you only invite those whom you love and whom love you? He said, at that, all other thoughts were driven from my mind. So he was thinking like, oh, keep coming. I've been 60 times coming to, to do Hajj. Oh, keep coming. And then... Well, what he saw in his dream, he was told that you know, you're not coming just to do hajj, you're coming because Allah wants to call you. Allah wants you to be there. And so that's why our intention should be when we go to the house of Allah, when we go to the masajid, when we go to the musallah, when you go to your prayer mat, that you're going to meet Allah there. And that Allah is calling you. And that Allah wants your, wants your liqa, wants to have a conference with you. I know we're busy and everything, but Allah wants a conference with us. So, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, that's... That's one of the intentions uh, that we'll have, inshallah, when we go to the, the house of Allah. And we'll continue next week, inshallah. Are there any questions about any of that? Yeah. Tabu. Um, Sheikh, um, the Sheikh was saying that you can have In relation to what? Yeah. Well, it's got to be a valid excuse, Sharan. Sharan. Yeah. So he's like, really, literally, being at home with kids and family. 
Not really. Not shut on. It might be a valid excuse to you, but not to the shut up. And look, unless, unless the, well, it's unless you got an, it's sunnah. It's not. It's not. The thing is, there's there's no hadith that have ever been related or narrated about the Prophet of Allah where he prayed by himself. He always prayed in congregation. Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, for a Muslim male to leave that without a proper excuse is problematic for that believer. Because we're, our job is to follow him, Ali says, so, okay. and, and he never, he never left that. He never, never. There's no riwayah. He may have, he may have prayed on his own. No one knows that. But there's no, no narration. There's no riwayah that came and said that's what he did, Ali says, so, 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 so that's why they say. Well, I mean, you've got, to be, you've got to weigh that up. You've got to weigh that up. There's one thing to leave the masjid and never go to the masjid. And there's one thing, you know, for certain circumstances, you can or you can't go there. But unless one's got a shoddy excuse, and if, if one's family is going to become lost, you know, they're going to, they're going to become dull, they're going to become misguided, that's a shoddy excuse. If that's what the case is going to be, then certainly it is. No. What is the best form of distraction in that sort of case? And you said to always maintain kushur of Allah even though you're sort of distracting yourself. Um, is it something, is it a particular action or is it just having the best intention for whatever, whatever type of halal distraction that is? So that's a good question about if one needs a distraction, what kind of distraction, what's best? I reckon surfing, man. So, no, I'm this up. But whatever, whatever it is works for you. You know, as long as it's halal, whatever works for you. So it might be exercise, it might be reading, it might be socializing, it might be chai lattes with your BFFs, I don't know. Whatever, whatever it is that you do, as long as it's halal, it's okay. And, and this, have you heard the story of um, Sayyidina Dawood Have you heard that story? Sayyidina Dawood is a, is a malik. A lot of the Bani Israel, they were kings and they were prophets. And you know, Sayyidina Dawood, you know what I mean? Was it, yeah, it wasn't Sulaiman. Was it Sulaiman? It was Sulaiman. I find it. Sayyidina Sulaiman. They're both kings. They're father and son. Uh, Sulaiman ibn Dawood. And then Sulaiman had... Are you sure it was, eh? Sattis al Sayyidina Najah? Dawood, Dawood. No, no. The Asfur, the little bird that came. Fatanna. Fatanna Futuna. Dawood. Dawood alayhi salam. Fatanna Futuna. The, the father and son, the, their stories are very similar actually. You know how many wives they would have while we're on the subject? <laughs> how many wives? Yeah, he had a uh, hundred wives and three hundred concubines. Uh, they would, that was Sulaiman, and they would have had thirty wives and a hundred concubines. So that, when the Christians and the Jews talk about Sayyidina Rasulullah, it doesn't compare. Right? So he said that they would, he was a king. He was a prophet, he was close to Allah, and he said to Allah, lead me to my own devices for one year. This is distractions. This is the point of the story of distraction. Right? Lead me, I'll be, able to, I'll be right. I'll be right. And Allah wants to say, no, 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 you can't. He said, all right, one month. He said, no, no, you can't. One week. No, 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 you can't. And they didn't have hours. One day. No, no, you can't. One peri- an hour, sa'i in a period of time. He said, all right. So between Asr, and Maghrib, he was in the house of Allah. Allah said, you're going to have that time. So he was praying and worshipping Allah. Then he saw a bird flew in the window, a beautiful bird he's never seen before. Oh, what a bird, mashallah. Went to the window, looked out the window, saw a woman, breathtaking woman. He fell in love with her. Even he had all the wives, say all those wives. So I can tell you the story. Distractions. Yeah? And then he saw her and he had one of his powerful generals, it was his wife. He sent him out on a campaign that there's no way he's coming back he got killed this, this is a prophet huh there's no, there's no joke here there's no joke yeah and then he married the wife and later on a guy came to him to, so he could wake up to himself he goes look man I'm a guy he said he's a, he's, a, he's a king 
He's a prophet and he's a, he's a judge between the people. He said, I'm a poor man. The guy came to say that there would, and he's, he's telling the story. It's a parable now. He said, say that there would. He said to him, you know. James broke into his house at night. The long story, yeah. Like, there's a lot to it. I'm just giving you the condensed version for the distraction. Yeah. And then he said to him, you know, I've only got one goat, and my brother's got 99 goats. And he said, don't worry about your one goat. Give it to me. And then Satan said, man, wake up to himself. What have I done? So if our distractions are going to send us down a road, and surfing's like that. If you go to the beach, people are naked. It's got that element to it. That's why you've got to pick the beach and pick your time. You can't go to Bondi on a Saturday and go surfing. Or, I don't know, some people can, but I can't. Because in the middle of summer. In the winter you can, there's no one there. I don't know, I've never been in winter, so I don't know. But, you know, you can't go there in summer. It's impossible because it's, just, it's fitna everywhere. So even when you're doing your distraction, your hobby, whatever it is that you're doing, it's still got to be halal and it's still got to be within the confines so you don't lose whatever. Because if one person, because that's how we are, that's our nature. And this story of Dawood, right? The story of Sayyidina Dawood, who Allah gave him, the Zabur, he's a Rasul and the Nabi's boat. He's not like a small fry. He's a big fish. Right? And that's what happened to him. So we got to keep those things in check. Everyone needs a hobby. And especially in our life, stressful and cars and, and you know, road rage. and It's not nice, our life. We're, we're city people. We're disconnected from the environment. You know, all that other stuff. We're hardly grounded. You know? But try and pick something. I, I would recommend pick something that's natural. Pick something that's, if you, especially if you're an office worker, do some sort of exercise. You know, try and be out in nature a little bit if you can do that, because it just breaks away that, that pain. Really, you can have a good intention for that too. For what? For a distraction. You have to have a good intention. Just for the sake of Allah, it can't work for you anyway. The, the intention with the distraction is to go back stronger to the ibadah, to the fara'id, and the has to be. It's not like, yeah, I just want to chill out and forget Allah for a while. Oh, forget I'm a Muslim for a while, don't worry, oh, I'm sick and tired of being a Muslim. No, it's not that. It's why there's the different rulings of things. Halal, the, you know, in the halal side, there's fard and wajib, sunnah, mubah, mustahab, mubah. So in those things that are mubah, that are permissible, then that gives, gives us this, just a chance to just chill out for a bit and then go, go hard again. Yeah. Any other questions before we fumble? Just regarding the, since you click on the, on the what for the pre match, when it gets tattered, what's to be done for that? Yeah, that's a good one. So the, when, when something gets destroyed, you can burn it, you know, you can rip it into little pieces as well. It's like the Masahif, you know, the books, the Quran, that we set them on fire. No. There's different sort of levels of intention to how strong it can really get into your heart. Um, like, for example, if you were eating food and then you, you tell yourself you're eating food for Allah so you can go and worship, but you're not fully believing that's your real intention. Are you still sort of getting rewards for it? Even if it's just very, very surface level. So the question is, if one's doing something with the intention and the intention's the surface level hasn't gone deep, will they get rewards? Inshallah, you will. And that's the beginning of it. Everything, when you first start doing it, it's hard. You know what I mean? And you don't really get the full intensity of it and the full depth of it. But as, as you continue practicing it, practice makes perfect. As you continue practice it, that depth will come, inshallah. And when that depth comes, that's when the real attachment comes. Because, you know, it's the shafaf, the, the, like the, the veils between the person and Allah will become less. They'll be, almost be able to see through those veils that certainly we've got to feel with our hearts and our souls and our essences Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence and, and that's in reality that's the real flavor that's the vulk they call it so yeah definitely good question mashallah. any other questions before we finish so it's, a topic question. it's all right the um, the hairs of a dog or something if that came on your clothes is that invalidate wudu all right so the question is the, the hairs from a dog a cat, no. A cat. cat is yeah. completely tahir. Except the Hanafis, they have, a, they have a different version of it where if the cat's a wild cat and it eats like carrion and things like that, but our domesticated cats, it wouldn't count for those things. 
So the question is, if a dog's hair comes on a person, does it invalidate wudu? It doesn't invalidate wudu, no matter what. Even if a dog licks you or will fall in feces, it doesn't invalidate wudu. But what it does invalidate is one of the conditions of salat, being that a person's body and clothes and place where they pray have to be pahir, have to be pure. Now, if a hair of a dog comes on a person, can they still pray? They can. And the prayer is still valid. Malikis have the dog doesn't have a hukum. That's it. The dog licks you. The dog, you know, whatever it does to you, it's all, it's all halal. It's all tahir, the whole dog. So that means, why I say that is not to freak you out. That means when you're going somewhere to do something and a dog jumps on you and he licks you and you can't change your clothes and you can't do whatever, don't say, I'm not going to pray. That's why I'm telling you that. Pray, right? And then when you get home and change your clothes, make it up. All right? All right, so the, the, the hukum of, um, of the dog is particularly the, 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 um, the saliva. And the reason why that is, is because the Prophet ﷺ saw a dog and it was licking, licking whatever, drinking out of a bowl. You know how the dogs, they, they say in Arabic, they, they lick, lapping. lapping. They're lapping in, the, in a bowl. And then he said, don't use that bowl because it's najis. So the Maliki say, the reason why it was, it, he said that is because that dog had rabies. That's what they say. And the others say, no, it's just because the dog is najis itself. So that's why. There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. And look how much total different jurisprudence it made. Okay, so if the saliva, the nose, the, the, any wet part of the dog comes on you, in the Shafi's, you have to wash that, that part of the clothes seven times. So that means pour water on it. So six times, and one of them has to be dirt. Didn't he just like pour once, pour six times? Well, it depends how you wash today. How do you wash? Oh, you, that's probably where you have to do that. If you're being literalist, no. you wash that area with water, and one of those, and the scholars say you can put just straight dirt, or you can mix the dirt with water and put it on it. So seven pours, if you like, of whatever. Make sure it's clean. The research has come out anyway. They're saying the only thing that gets rid of the the bacteria and stuff from pigs and dogs is dirt. That's what the research is saying anyway, so hygiene purposes. Now, is that it? All right, so it's, summer's finished, everyone. It's over. There's no more late nights. There's no more staying up late. You know, Maghrib is like 10 past or a bit later, seven, 15 past 7. That means Isha is like, you know, about now. So, and that means you can sleep early because if you don't sleep early, your body won't be able to recover from the, all the fun you've been having in, in summer. And plus, Ramadan's coming up six weeks. Yeah, it's only going to be a month and a bit after daylight savings, almost a month to the day actually, after daylight savings. And if we're not training from now to get up at the Hajjud time, to get up and, and, and um, have suhoor, and all, not only that, but to recite the Qur'an, so when it comes in Ramadan, we're already in form, then... Ramadan's going to, another Ramadan's going to pass and we're not going to feel like we've got any benefit, let alone the full benefit of Ramadan. And having our bodies accustomed and strong enough to deal with the rigors of Ramadan is very important for us. Especially us sedentary people that do office work and that stuff. You know, our bodies are not very strong and our immune systems are not very strong. And the, the, it's going to be in May, the first week of May, and it's cold waking up at, at, you know, at suhoor time and you get sick and it's not, you don't get the full benefit of Ramadan. So try as much as you can to sleep earlier than you have been sleeping previously, especially in the summertime. And inshallah azawajal, that, that backup, that build up, that routine of sleep will help you through the month inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will help you get the full benefit of it.